Yeah, good Nachmittag. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon from Berlin, Germany, um, and from many other places in this webinar, wherever it is morning, afternoon, or evening, or night, uh, you're very welcome. Welcome to this uh, in South North exchange on Germany's hydrogen strategy and the Global South, organized by Heinrich Böll Foundation and Brot für die Welt. Germany is a front runner in the development of a hydrogen economy, and it's currently revising its hydrogen strategy. Imports play an important role, and the country is contemplating a hydrogen import strategy. Germany has been historically importing fossil energy for a very long time. Oil from the very beginning of the oil age, later fossil gas from Norway, Russia, and the Netherlands in during the past decades, also coal from Russia, South Africa, and Colombia, for example. These trade relationships have frequently left a legacy of pollution and destruction in the places where these fossil energies have been mined or extracted. And they have definitely left another toxic legacy in our atmosphere, climate disruption, heat waves, droughts, and floods that, floods that we are now experiencing, hitting the global south brutally. So it's vital that we move away from this fossil past as quickly as possible. We really, really need to get going. Many of Germany's partners in this now envisaged uh, hydrogen trade are from the global south. How can we avoid the pitfalls of past energy trades and ensure a fair and truly sustainable relationship between producer and consumer countries of green hydrogen? What is needed to ensure that local communities prosper and benefits accrue to all participants in the trade and investment relationship. In this event, we want to open up a very much needed dialogue between stakeholders from the Global South and Germany to discuss urgent, urgent issues regarding the German hydrogen strategy. Before I hand over to my colleague Karen Benzev from Cape Town, who is facilitating this event, let me just say one quick word regarding the very recent agreement within the governing coalition in Germany to include hydrogen in our law on climate neutral heat heating. This definitely is not a positive example how to use and govern hydrogen. The illusion of a continuation of the existing fossil gas based infrastructure just with hydrogen is going to be very expensive, will delay the energy transition and will prove to be a dead end. It is a shocking example how ruthless populist politics can derail rational science-based decision-making. I hope that this will not set the example for future development of the German hydrogen strategy. Let me thank to all the participants of this conversation, to our partners at Board for the Welt, in particular Joachim Fünfgeld, to my team member Elena Knant, and to Gabriel Fritz from the technical team to, for making this event possible. So I'm handing over to you, Karen, uh, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Jörg. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. A warm welcome to our audience and panelists once again. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. We very much look forward to this engagement, particularly at this political juncture. As the example Jörg just mentioned, um, there is really a need for us to be in more consistent dialogue um, around these really critical questions that will shape, uh, that have the, the power to shape very different futures and very different uh, future parts in both global North and South. Our program today will proceed in two parts. In part one, we will invite two short provocations engaging with Germany's hydrogen strategy. In part two, we will move to a more dynamic conversation that brings in voices from our colleagues from Global South hydrogen export countries, as well as other German voices from parliament and industry. We will open up for questions in the second part of the program. So if you have questions or thoughts regarding the two provocation we will hear now, please type them in the Q&A tab, indicating to whom they are addressed, and they will be picked up. This is, of course, something that you can do throughout the discussions. You can also vote up questions you find relevant with a like. So when we bring your voices into the conversations, we have a sense of what the burning issues are and what people, what, what our audience, what you, our audience, would like to engage on. 
So let's get going with our first two inputs. We're very fortunate to have with us Dr. Falk Burmaker of the German Federal Ministry for the Economy and Climate. Dr. Burmaker is the Division Head for General Issues of Bilateral Climate and Energy Cooperation, Cooperation with North America, East Asia, Oceania, and Turkey. Uh, Dr. Bumaka is a lawyer, and before he took up his current position, he was the economic counselor for the German embassy in Washington. Before that, he was the counselor of the German federal minister, ministry for economic affairs and energy. And before that, he was in my part of the world as the head of the economic division of the German embassy in Pretoria. So I think I can say Sabona, Dr. Bumaka, thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Uh, and if needed, I ask for your permission to let you know 30 seconds before your time is up uh, that you will need to wrap up your inputs. Well, thank you very much. Uh, now I can see myself. I hope you can see me too. Um, thank you very much for the warm welcome and the reminder of a very good time in South Africa. Um, still uh, remembering it very well. Uh, but today uh, my task is as the head of division for uh, climate and energy partnerships to update you on um, our strategy when it comes to hydrogen imports um, and uh, where we stand in this regard. Um, most of you know that we have the National Hydrogen Strategy in Germany of 2020, and that we are currently in the process of updating that uh, strategy. Uh, it, the, the old version already states why we need hydrogen or why we are looking at this topic uh, so closely. Uh, green hydrogen, from our point of view, is the key to decarbonizing and fully decarbonizing our economies, especially those sectors that we call hard to electrify, hard to abate, uh, such as steel production, chemical production, heavy shipping, and aviation. And from our point of view, hydrogen imports and the hydrogen use is not a distance fantasy. Uh, but it is happening now. Um, that means production sites um, have been chosen and uh, on some of them, the, the building of these production sites have started. We're looking at import capacities and obviously we're looking at offtake and there in, and when we look at the transition of our industry, there's also a lot happening already. What is the role of imports when we look at the national hydrogen strategy um, is very big. Uh, to tell you the truth, maybe we will uh, almost say it is dominant uh, because the hydrogen strategy clearly states that we are interested in building up hydrogen production in Germany, but it will not by far not be enough to cover uh, the expected demand. Um, so it states that two thirds of uh, the hydrogen demand will have to be imported. Um, that's the need of hydrogen. That's why our, one of our tasks. Uh, Dr. Bulmaka, yes. I wonder if I can interrupt you for just one second. Um, you sure. were beginning to cut out. Um, I'm not sure um, what we can do to improve the connection. Um, Perhaps the technical team maybe, can advise. Maybe he can turn off the video. Uh, turn off the video, I can do that. Now everybody has seen me. <laughs> is this better? Yes, it is. Okay, please interrupt me again if it, if it drops out um, and then uh, we'll, we'll try again. Um, what I last said was we needed global hydrogen market uh, and we are working on that. That's one of our tasks of the bilateral cooperation um, that we are looking at. And we want to use the economies of scale, obviously, to drive costs and prices for green hydrogen uh, down. So the update of the hydrogen strategy will also give us the task to draft an import strategy. Um, especially dedicated uh, to the topic of imports, since it is 
uh, one important part. Um, the questions we have to answer in this import strategy is uh, the relationship between imports from inside Europe and outside Europe. And that brings us to an important question. We always talk about hydrogen and hydrogen imports, but in general, we mean uh, different things or several things. And that is pure hydrogen as it is and uh, products that derive from um, hydrogen um, like ammonia, like methanol, like uh, sustainable aviation fuels. And we would expect that um, a large part of the pure hydrogen could be transported through pipelines uh, within Europe or uh, from areas very close to Europe. Um, whereas these derivatives um, can easily be shipped uh, also from uh, locations further away. Uh, so we really have, um, in general, we have to uh, make sure that we know what we talk, to about, uh, talk about. Um, what we are doing um, for supporting uh, the imports uh, is several instruments. Um, most of you might have heard of our main instrument, which is called H2 Global, which is basically awarding a 10-year off-take uh, contract. And um, the intermediary, the H2 Global Foundation, uh, will then sell that product in, on a yearly basis into the market. And if there is a gap between what the foundation has acquired um, and what it is able to sell for, if there's a gap between the price um, of supply and the price of demand, the German government uh, will cover that gap for a period of 10 years time. That is uh, supposed to address uh, first movers and support first movers. So uh, they don't wait for the supply or for the demand but um, actually move on with establishing these trade routes. Um, there's also the important projects of common European interest, uh, which is dedicated to build up um, offtake uh, in Europe for, for hydrogen and help with the transformation of sectors like the steel sector. There is an international funding guideline providing um, support for projects. And there is political support um, through our climate and energy partnerships, which uh, almost all of them have established uh, hydrogen working groups. And one example um, is, is our energy partnership with Canada, where Chancellor Scholz and Vice Chancellor Habeck um, went to last year. And this, uh, these talks alone and this, um, um, being in Canada alone and putting that uh, topic on the top of the political agenda helped a lot to incentivize uh, private uh, projects and private uh, companies to talk to each other and try to build up uh, an Atlantic hydrogen corridor. Um, the working groups are looking at supporting the partner governments in their strategy, their regulatory framework for uh, green hydrogen and to achieve planning certainty. Um, also, we are preparing research partnerships, um, which is also important to develop uh, these, this new product and new production cycles. Accordingly, it is uh, looking at training of local professionals um, and I already mentioned the, the funding mechanisms that obviously also play a role in our bilateral uh, relationships. So we are trying to make sure, or we have to make sure that we're talking about true partnerships. And that means that it's not only in the interest of Germany to do that, but it is also in the interest of our partner um, and that there is added value um, for the partner because uh, then we make sure that we have a long lasting and sustainable uh, trade relation that is that is built up. And I think uh, we, we, we can discuss uh, a bit more uh, in the panel what that actually means. Uh, and then last but not least, we are looking at the offtake in Germany 
uh, because that is one of the questions I'm always asked, where is my guaranteed offtake, which volume, which product, at what time? Um, and uh, we, are, we, we have installed an instrument called climate contracts, which is ba basically a contract uh, for difference mechanism, um, helping the transformation of our steel and chemical industry. And that automatically creates um, the offtake for hydrogen or hydrogen derivatives. So basically we are trying to build up um, the supply. We are trying to build up the supply chain, including the uh, logistics, and we are trying to build up the offtake. So that is a huge task to do that all at the same time. Um, and at uh, the same time, we have to keep in mind uh, that we can't wait any longer. And that was stressed in, in the introductory note. Um, so speed is of essence. Um, and that's uh, why I'm looking forward to the discussion and maybe uh, even more ideas how to accelerate our endeavor uh, and how to answer some of the still open questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Burmacher. Um, I, oh, sorry, I'm having trouble starting my video, um, but let me continue. I'd like to move straight to our second speaker, uh, Ms. Delia Villagrasa. Uh, Ms. Villagrasa has worked for many years on international climate, energy, and environmental policy issues for a wide array, array of organizations, including the Government of Luxembourg, the European Climate Foundation, and WWF. She has worked as our advisor on this project uh, and will speak to the research and uh, conclusions that were arrived at. Ms. Villagrasa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Karen. I'm trying to give you my screen so you can see the presentation, putting it into presentation mode, if that works. Here we go. So thank you all for being here. And I would like to start with a little bit of a caveat. Our comments here on the new hydrogen strategy or NWS for short as the German um, acronym, refer to the leaked draft of the 24th of February of this year. So they may not reflect the current status. And I've already taken a few updates from, from um, the German colleagues speaking before. Our comments pertain specifically to the import and trade elements, not the overall strategy. And the recommendations we are putting forward are based on the big report, which the Böll Foundation and Port für die Welt did last year. And here you see the link to that uh, report we did last year. And I'm sure the slides will be shared afterwards. So you have the link also in writing. There's quite a few positive points in the draft strategy. Basically, it mentions all the critical factors which are relevant to sustainable trade and production of green hydrogen, such as human rights, environmental and social issues, the need to contribute to exporting countries' energy transitions, but also the need for them to profit economically beyond the export revenue created. It also states the ambition for green hydrogen to be the solution over time. And it does mention the primacy of electrification overall, so that hydrogen should not be used just for anything. But <laughs> there's always a but. There's also a few, excuse me, critical points. And in particularly, um, there's not enough focus in our opinion, on the use of green hydrogen. Actually, it doesn't always say green hydrogen, rather hydrogen. There's still a lot of text referring to transport and in particularly bad heating applications. There's also not just green hydrogen in the strategy. There's a lot of mention of blue hydrogen and actually also potentially other color hydrogen. And that could obviously create lock-ins. The, the reasoning is that other hydrogen could be used to build up the market. However, obviously, if you create the infrastructure for one type of hydrogen, then you're 
in big danger that nobody will want to disinvest from that. And then the switch to a cleaner system with green hydrogen becomes more difficult. And obviously blue hydrogen can create very significant emissions, particularly methane. The sustainability criteria we feel are not sufficiently clear and mandatory in the draft strategy. Um, they're referred to, but they're not being listed clearly. And um, the link is made with H2 global criteria, but these need strengthening. So this will be an important point for us. And often the criteria which are mentioned, it's should language and not shall language. So the mandatory nature of the criteria um, we're a bit concerned about. Um, maybe a little bit more detail on this, particularly on the um, environmental impacts. The only one really mentioned is water scarcity in the draft, um, but other uh, environmental impacts with associated with um, H2 production and trade are not really looked at. And it's really important to look at all those other impacts too, carbon emissions, land use, biodiversity, through the entire value chain. Um, regarding standards, the integration of social and environmental standards, again, it's kind of mentioned, but it's not quite clear how exactly this will be done. And on governance, we were a little bit worried regarding the draft strategy, pushing a lot of the development of criteria and standards to the international arena, namely G7 and G20 and not necessarily showing that Germany could go first together maybe with the EU. And that could create a, a low level of criteria in the end and hinder the progress towards a really sustainable hydrogen market. So we formulated a few key thoughts how you could address that. Um, regarding the use of hydrogen, it's not quite clear because the numbers mentioned for hydrogen need are pretty big, um, what these are based on, what scenarios have been looked at. So it would be important to ensure that any scenario really only focuses on what is truly needed. So not hydrogen for like heating, but those sectors which truly, truly cannot be decarbonized otherwise. And if that's done, you actually can minimize the import needs and that makes it cheaper. Very important, any support instrument and any cooperation and infrastructure should focus exclusively on green hydrogen. You all know that 99% of hydrogen at the moment is not green. So if you want that market to take off, any new instruments now need to focus on it and not on what you already have. And then we would like to see the sustainability criteria to be made mandatory and be really specific within the um, within the criteria list. As a little example, I would like to mention the issue of water where the strategy does refer to H2 Global. And we looked at the H2 Global um, criteria, but that is actually just saying, well, the water used for electrolysis, etc., should not consume water aimed at human consumption or fossil water in dry regions. But it doesn't say anything about potentially creating additional freshwater resources for the people on the ground. It does not mention that actually dry regions may not be the only ones undergoing water stress. And also there's no mention of desalination and ensuring that the resulting brine is correctly dispersed or otherwise used. So just as an example, the concretization is really a bit of a challenge uh, here. Um, on the governance issue, I mentioned that already, it would be really nice to see the leadership being put forward. You have now a good diplomatic core on climate change, so use it for strong standards and certification. Establish these within Germany and the EU, and then having something really strong oneself, I think will make the international fora work a lot more credible and likely to carry success. I mean, this is really a little bit yeah. in a nutshell. I've been really quick. I could ask you to wrap up. Exactly. And this is basically what we should have. But that's in the report I mentioned. So I'm ending here. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Villagracia and Dr. Burmaka for getting the conversation started. Uh, Dr. Burmaka, since I'm sure you'd like to engage on some of the issues brought up, uh, please note these down and we can come back to them when we circle back to you as part of the panel. So without further ado, let me introduce our panel. We are joined by Nidal Atia, the Program Coordinator for Sustainable Development and Environmental Policies at the Heinrich Bull Foundation, Tunis. Before working at the Heinrich Bull Foundation, Mr. Atia worked at the Alternative Youth Network Tunisia and the Mediterranean Forum on Climate, Energy and Youth Issues. Preparing for this, I also learned that he's a marine biologist. Next in our lineup of speakers, we have Fabian Andres Leon Panuela, a legal researcher on human rights, corporate accountability and public law. He is now working as a program manager and researcher at the Columbia Office of the Business and Human Rights Resource Center in Colombia. Recently, he did work for the Heinrich Bull Foundation in Colombia regarding human rights challenges in the hydrogen trade. Uh, we are also joined by Rodrigo Astorga, Program Coordinator for Socio-Ecological Transformation at the Heinrich Bull Foundation in Chile. And before he joined HBF Chile, Mr. Astorga was a consultant at the International Institute for Sustainable Development, the Global Environment Facility, the International Labor Organization, and the Economic Commission for Latin America and Caribbean, among others. And then we are very pleased and privileged to have with us uh, Mr. Julian Schorp, uh, Taysom Krupp Steel Europe's Head of Decarbonization. Prior to joining Tyson Krupp, Mr. Schorp was a journalist specializing on energy issues and was the head of the European Energy and Climate Policy Unit at the Association of German Chambers of Commerce and Industry in Brussels. We will also be joined, uh, she will be a little bit late, but we are also very happy that we will be joined by Ms. Katrin Ullisch, a Green Party member in the German Parliament. Prior to being an elected representative, Ms. Ullisch was the policy advisor to the Green Party in the State Parliament in North Rhine-Westphalia and head of the head of and head of office for the Green Member of Parliament, Oliver Krischer. So welcome to all of you, and thank you also, Dr. Burmaka, for staying with us on this panel. And let's kick off the discussion. Uh, if you are able to switch your cameras on, those who are part of the uh, panel, that would be great. Um, I think you, I think you do have them. Oh, Mr. Ule, uh, Ms. Ulish, you are here. Apologies, I didn't see you before. Um, so let's kick off our panel discussion by bringing in voices from the Global South into the room. My first question is to Mr. Atia. Mr. Atia, can you tell us a little bit more about how green hydrogen is being discussed in Tunisia? What hopes are the most prominent and which fears are the most pressing? Thank you, Kayla. So hello, everyone. I am uh, Nidal Atia, as you uh, presented me from my uh, HBF office uh, in Tunis, in Tunisia. Uh, thank you, Kenna, for giving me the floor, and I'd like also to thank colleagues from different HBF offices for offering this uh, opportunity of having a dialogue between the North and the South around the topic of green hydrogen. I'd like also to welcome uh, different uh, guests, including uh, Dr. Falke Bomeke and Ms. Uh, Catherine Ullier. So uh, in the beginning, I believe that uh, this discussion is very important for the Tunisian uh, public, and I'm glad to take part to it in order to share some of civil society uh, concerns around uh, green hydrogen uh, production in Tunisia. In the introduction also, I'd like to say that uh, like many other countries around the world, hydrogen and more specifically green hydrogen has reached the sphere of our uh, Tunisian, uh, Tunisian decision makers. Uh, indeed, our uh, Ministry of uh, Energy has decided to move ahead rapidly with the development of uh, green hydrogen uh, with the support of uh, the GIZ in its implementation uh, part and with the finance uh, coming from the uh, BMZ. So there is a specific uh, framework uh, which is then increasingly uh, being shaped. And uh, as a foundation from our side, uh, while the national strategy for green hydrogen is being uh, prepared for 
possible launch in uh, 2000, 2024, so next year. We uh, believe that green hydrogen could be a concrete mechanism that can faster the energy transition process, which is struggling in, in Tunisia. And those who know the uh, Tunisian context, context are aware that we did not reach the targeted objective of 12% of renewable energies in 2020. And we are uh, we have fixed an ambitious ob objective of uh, 35% of our energy electricity uh, uh, mix by uh, 2030. So uh, this is subject of certain number of uh, standards. And in this uh, framework, the discussion we have initiated since a couple of years in Tunisia uh, around uh, green hydrogen is about uh, how an energy uh, justice perspective could help improve future partnership approaches between the North and the South more specifically Tunisia and uh, Germany, in order to reach a win-win relationship and to achieve twin goals of uh, global climate change mitigation, but also sustainable development in the global south in general or in Tunisia. So uh, I would like also to say that in addition to these uh, two goals, energy uh, transition, uh, imperative, we can say is also an economic matter in Tunisia because of the cost of energy importation, which represents 3.7% uh, of our uh, GDP, and then uh, costs us more than one third of the annual trade deficit. So uh, green hydrogen is needed for the acceleration of energy transition and the, all other points I have raised, but we need to make sure that related risks are taken into uh, consideration seriously. And today, the ongoing uh, energy strategy for green hydrogen raises several questions in, in Tunisia. And if I have to maybe stress one point among uh, this list, I choose to uh, highlight uh, water uh, needs. Um, actually, between 18 and 25 kilograms of pure uh, water uh, per one kilogram of hydrogen are needed. And uh, this is, of course, if we uh, take uh, the uh, process in efficiencies into consideration. So such considerable needs in one, maybe have to remember it, um, remind it in one of the advised countries in the Mediterranean region can be very problematic, especially that we are also witnessing very frequent demonstrations and conflicts around the quality, the access and the use of water uh, since climate condition became so pronounced in uh, Tunisia. So this is also uh, this also concerns, of course, the whole MENA region, which is considered as one of the most water stressed areas in the world. Uh, for us, it seems clear that our discussion from our discussions uh, with decision makers, Tunisian decision makers, that desalination will be the source of water for green hydrogen production. But despite the fact that desalination is growing rapidly worldwide as a potential solution, it's it also presents essential uh, drawbacks. Uh, maybe I can mention the limited public understanding of the role, the importance, the benefits of, uh, and the environmental challenges of uh, desalination. There is also the high financial uh, costs and energy costs needed to transform seawater into uh, pure water. Uh, here, it's important to know that uh, uh, one cubic meter uh, in Tunisia costs um, more than 10 times water uh, that we have in our uh, tub. So, and in among these uh, uh, this uh, cost, we have 40% for, uh, of the cost for one cubic meter uh, of desalinated sea water is for energy. So uh, I would like to, um, to mention this because it's important to uh, not to dissociate uh, water and energy since we are advocating in Tunisia for this nexus or systemic uh, approach uh, thinking. Among also the drawbacks, we have the environmental impacts for uh, concentrated disposal, like the superheated uh, effluent that uh, many thermal uh, plants discharge back into the sea. We have also uh, the brine that can also uh, deplete oxygen in surrounding waters, suffocating marine organisms and disrupting uh, food uh, chains. So all these uh, risks are now are not new and uh, uh, has also been raised, for example, by UN, UN who has warned for the uh, 
rising levels of toxin brine as desalination plants meet growing water needs. And uh, on the average, the production of one liter of drinking water requires to the use of uh, 1.5 liters of brine. And this is, of course, depending on uh, the salinity, the conditions, and the use of technology. So uh, to summarize maybe what I have said, and not to make uh, and in order to make the question clear, the economic development of nitrogen is uh, closely linked to another element that is fundamental to development and even a condition for it, which is uh, water resources. So here is my question: uh, How it, can it be? Or how is it uh, possible today to work? for the development of green hydrogen in the South, and especially uh, in uh, Tunisia, while guaranteeing the preservation of the already scale resource of uh, water. It's clear now that part of the answer lies uh, with our Tunisian decision makers as um, exporters, but it's legitimate, it's a legitimate question to ask actuals positioned as importers, especially that Germany is currently revising its uh, hydrogen uh, strategy. So this is, of course, one uh, concern among uh, others that we have formulated in our national report, and of course that uh, uh, we can found in the uh, uh, global um, joint synthesis uh, reports. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Atia. Moving across the Atlantic, uh, Mr. Penuela, are the concerns raised in Tunisia some that are also prominent in Colombia? Or which would you say loom largest for potential green hydrogen host communities in Colombia? Actually, we share a uh, hi everyone. <laughs> Sorry for my camera, it's very, very creepy <laughs> today. Uh, actually, we share uh, the same kind of problem with Tunisia. But also we have the different uh, another different context. Colombia has an an historic uh, arbed conflict that uh, introduced another element to take into account in this discussion because all the projects come into different territories, principally in the north of the country, in order to promote this kind of transition. And those lands have uh, several problems with water. Uh, like uh, Mr. Mihal uh, said about Tunisia, and also we have problems. So we have a problem with the access to water, and we have problem with the, the conflict, the arbitrary conflict in the country. So, Mr. Penuela, your your voice or your microphone is not so clear. I wonder if we should just take one second um, for you to test your speaker and sound, um, so that we can hear you clearer. Is better like that? Definitely. Thank you. Uh, it was my my microphone. Sorry. So I I, I was say that we, we share the same problem with Tunisia. Uh, those problems that Nidal mentioned, but we have another element to take into account: the arbitrary conflict. So for us, uh, the problem is uh, water stress, uh, non consultancy arbitrary conflict. So this kind of project came into these territories with a security um, model of protection for companies. And this element to introduce another problem that uh, they use the, the transition in order to militarize territories. So this is a kind of, it's another uh, element to take into account. And of course, we have the same problem like uh, water stress. We have problem that, uh, for example, in Colombia, in the north, uh, in the Guajira, uh, they are the most part of the um, of the projects of Iolix and Eolix principally, and the green hydrogen intentions. And this land have problem of what access of water. A uh, child died, uh, children died every day because they don't have water and food. And the problem is in all the discussion and the discourse of the projects, we don't listen to uh, what we will do with the problem of the water. And all the hydrogen projects use water. And actually, we know that the water we need should be uh, pure. Do, can, uh, it could be not uh, the salinization water, for example. So. Uh, the, the pure water uh, for, consum for human consumption will be used. And these people that have very, very hard, uh, hard problem with the water don't have solution. 
Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Panuela. Um, let me bring in uh, Mr. Astorga. Uh, Chile, I think, is well known as being at the forefront of the green hydrogen export race. Do the issues raised by Mr. Atia and Mr. Panuela resonate with you? And what is the conversation in Chile focused on? Hello, do you hear me well? Hear you perfectly, thank you. Thank you, I had some uh, technical problems also. So, <laughs> um, I'm from my telephone. So, I would like to talk about uh, a bit about governance in the long term. Uh, the elements to consider when investing, for example, in Chile, and uh, if there are any yellow lights, I would say that uh, it depends on the standards with which you want to operate. In general, companies linked to natural resources in Chile comply with the national regulations, all right? And of course, operate with an approved environmental qualification re resolution. Yet, conflicts with local communities constantly break out and social environmental happens. In the last decades, a series of uh, social environmental conflicts have arisen due to weak institutional capacity uh, or, env or environmental legislation and governance, it's always one step behind the problems. That's a classical here. In fact, the absence of territorial planning, dialogue, and pre-investment agreements has meant that large projects, for example, in copper, with a high impact, uh, are often bad considered. It has been extremely difficult to move towards a logic of sharing benefits with communities and caring for the natural and cultural heritage. And then the judicialization of conflicts due to the lack of mechanism that allow stakeholders to reach agreements entails a high economic cost for the country and also for private companies. So even though this is understood, it is a very strong resistance to change. The way Chile has been doing business and attracting foreign direct investment operates in the so-called race to the bottom. That is, the country seeks to position itself as one of the largest producers of uh, green hydrogen globally with a great potential for renewable generation, but being located far away and requiring maritime routes, technology, infrastructure, and all this stuff uh, for the exports. This ends up convincing policymakers that the best option for attractiveness is to lower environmental and social standards. Therefore, it's not easy to stop doing business as usual. My point is that in a German green hydrogen strategy, given the impact it will have on the territory, companies and the German state can promote an agenda that lays the foundation for best practice model or a benchmark in which citizen participation, the impact of projects on the territory, mitigation and compensation, technological development, among others, are considered. That standard is more likely to come from Germany than from the global south, because the perverse incentives. That's my point. And it's precisely this standard of governance that can be attractive for the creation of a, a stable and long-term partnership agreement. And here is my question. What do you think of these elements of governance in the long term? And in the short medium term, there are elements of supply and demand to consider. Uh, how does Germany regulate or evaluate its uh, green hydrogen needs before investing in new capacity and imports? Has the elasticity, elasticity of energy substitution in the different German productive sectors been estimated? Is there any priorization? Have you considered brine mining, I'm talking about water, as a form of circular economy uh, with the hydrogen production? What about uh, green industrial policy, but here, or, or the local jobs and qualifications required here? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Storga. Um, Mr. Shorp, moving to you. There are a lot of promises and hopes associated with green hydrogen. But as Jörg mentioned in his introduction, there are also controversies. 
Um, and one of them is the question of clear prioritization of green hydrogen use. I think it is well known that if we use the precious resource of green hydrogen for the wrong reasons, it could actually delay decarbonization rather than accelerate it. Should there be consideration of how green hydrogen will be used and not just how it is made? What, what is the opinion of uh, industry on this question? Yeah, I hope you can hear me. Yes, perfect. So first of all, many thanks for having us uh, at the table here, the virtual table. Um, we are really happy to engage in this conversation with all of you. Um, yeah, first of all, let me just briefly say why the hydrogen topic is so important for us as a company. Yeah? Um, I think uh, it might not be um, public information, partially it is, but I think it's good if I briefly explain it. Um, so ThyssenKrupp Steel is Germany's biggest flat steel producer. We produce over 10 million tons of steel every year, uh, mainly in our German plants, especially in Duisburg, in North Rhine-Westphalia. Um, and um, currently we produce um, this steel with our four blast furnaces, uh, which are highly carbon intensive. Huh? So we are one of the biggest industrial CO2 emitters in Germany. We emit more than 20 million tons every year. This is roughly 2% of Germany's total um, CO2 emissions. So we have a huge responsibility to decarbonize very quickly in the coming years to achieve also our climate targets that we have clearly set in our strategy. We want to reduce our CO2, CO2 emissions by 30% until 2030 and then by basically almost 100% until 2030. Uh, 45 at the latest. But let me be also very clear, we are part of those industries or these industries in Europe that are regulated by the European Emissions Trading Scheme. So this Emissions Trading Scheme will lead to an explosion of CO2 prices for energy intensive industries in the coming years. Um, and this means basically that we have a lot of regulatory pressure also to reduce our CO2 emissions very quickly. And to be honest, I think in the next 10 years, most of the blast furnaces we use cannot be used anymore uh, in a commercial uh, manner, uh, to say it like that. Yeah. So we will have to replace these blast furnaces very rapidly. And to do so, we will build so-called direct reduction plants. These are the new uh, green pig iron um, plants. Um, and in these plants, we will have to use hydrogen uh, to reduce the iron ore in instead of coal. And um, our hydrogen needs are really massive. We just decided a few months ago to, to construct a first DR plant until 2026. We will first use natural gas in this plant, but in within a very short time frame already in 2028, we will use a very high hydrogen share in order also to achieve our ambitious climate goals. And for this first DR plant, we already need more than 140,000 tons of hydrogen every year. This is basically 10 times more than the total uh, green hydrogen production in the EU uh, currently. So that's a big challenge for us to get enough green hydrogen to our steel plant in Duisburg within um, the coming um, years. So it was a bit too long, but I think it was important to, to lay out why we need hydrogen um, urgently. Basically, for the primary steel production, there is no alternative, so especially uh, in Europe. Um, so on your very specific questions, we would completely agree with what the uh, Heinrich Böll Foundation also said at the beginning of this event. We need a clear prioritization. Um, I think it's also in line with the thinking of the German Ministry of Economy. Um, we should really focus the hydrogen use um, on the hard to abate sectors that have no alternative to decarbonize, decarbonize their production processes. And another important criteria should also be the greenhouse gas abatement potential they offer. This means we have some sectors, for instance, the steel, steel sector, where you can save a lot of CO2 emissions by using one ton of hydrogen. We can, for instance, save more than 20 tons, roughly 24, 25 tons. It depends on how you calculate it um, uh, in practice. But um, so we have a very huge potential to reduce our CO2 emissions by using hydrogen. 
In many other sectors, this is clearly not the case. And in addition, there are alternatives. So we fully support your ask for a clear prioritization. And we also hope very much this, that this will be again reflected in the now uh, revised uh, hydrogen strategy of the uh, German government. We know that there are discussions, there are some parties out there, some political groups, um, which are, let's say, advocating for broader utilization of hydrogen. But from our perspective, this, this, this does not really make sense from an economic point of view, of course, but also this is the most important argument from a climate protection perspective. Yeah? And uh, we will also we will already struggle to get enough hydrogen for our German hard to abate sectors. So please let's focus on them and make sure that they can access this um, renewable hydrogen and other types of climate friendly hydrogen at a, an affordable price also at the end. That's important for us too. I will stop here and um, yeah, look forward to the discussion. <laughs> Sorry you. for being a bit long. No, not at all. Thank you, Mr. Schork. Um, I guess that was the view from the front of the line in a way. Um, and uh, I'd like to bring uh, Ms. Ulish into the conversation. Um, how could we ensure that through this trade, there are opportunities for value add and job creation in the global south? Ms. Ulish, and thank you for being with us. Thank you so much um, for inviting me to this panel. It's an interesting discussion. We in the German parliament discuss it in a differentiated way, I guess. We um, just, uh, while well, we are working on a report by, in the Office of Technology Assessment at the German Bundestag right now, that has a look at the implementation of cooperation between the Global South and Germany, um, with regards to hydrogen, um, we had a presentation a couple of weeks back that stated clearly that there are opportunities in a trade agreement, in a corporation, um, but we also have, as a Green Party, a particular focus on what we do or how we support the countries that we do tra trade agreements with. Um, it's important to us that when we talk about green hydrogen, the electricity that is produced to produce the hydrogen is additional. So that we do not stop, uh, stop the energy vendor um, within the country, because we are aware that most countries in the global south have a rising demand of electricity or energy supply in general. Um, so we want to create partnerships where we, as Germany, support the development of renewable energies within the region, within the country, and at the same time um, benefit from a trade agreement that um, looks at hydrogen. Um, I'm, I actually listened uh, quite closely to uh, Mr. Schaub because we are aware um, within the coalition um, that currently uh, forms the government, that uh, there are certain sectors that really require hydrogen to decarbonize. So um, in the coalition agreement, we clearly state that we are aware that we cannot produce all the hydrogen we will need in Germany, and that we will need to import hydrogen or some form um, of derivat at um, a certain point so that the industry can decarbonize. Um, not all coalition partners see eye to eye which sectors um, really demand hydrogen or which require hydrogen to uh, decarbonize. It's our perspective as the Green Party that we should focus on those sectors that really do not have any other alternative than hydrogen, which mainly is the industry like the steel production industry, um, but also um, air transportation, heavy transportation on the road, um, shipping services. Um, in these areas, we do not have any other solution right now than hydrogen, but we are aware that um, we, require a lot of more electricity, the more hydrogen we need. 
So we are looking at opportunities that give us green hydrogen, but at the same time, support local structures, involve local communities in the global south, and that are a partnership on an equal level and um, that supports the en energy vendor in the countries we cooperate with. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Ulish. Um, I really have some follow-up questions, but I know I have to circle back to uh, Dr. Burmaker because you have been really patient and I'm sure you want to comment on a lot of the issues that have come up. Now I found the unmute button. Um, yes, uh, thank you for, for giving me the floor again. Um, obviously that's a, those are very interesting remarks from the Global South and also in the chat, I see a lot of different um, remarks. Uh, I'm not sure if I can answer all of them. Um, timeline is, is a question that I'm always asked. Um, I would love to know myself, uh, but uh, I'm pretty sure that until the end of the year, we will have an updated national hydrogen strategy and an import strategy. Um, and uh, hopefully it will, it will come even quicker than that. Um, and then on the question of sustainability uh, and what was raised from colleagues um, from different countries, um, those are very, very important points. And I mentioned them in my remarks uh, that we really want uh, to see it develop as a true partnership where there is added value for both partners. Um, and that also means that we take the concerns of our partners very seriously and, and try to address them. Um, I must say to get the, to get the discussion going, um, we cannot solve all the problems uh, of the world and all trade problems with the hydrogen production. So we need to be uh, at some point just enough uh, to, to stay realistic. So that means we, we take these concerns seriously and we address them, for example, water availability, um, but it is not the task of the hydrogen production to produce uh, fresh water for the population of the country. Um, that's a different task. Um, and there are probably a lot of projects where this is the case because there will be desalination needed and there will be overcapacity. The same way uh, electricity, if I look uh, at projects, for example, in Namibia, where I see a lot of overcapacity being built um, at certain times and that could decarbonize uh, the electricity system in Namibia, uh, but it's not the primary task. So uh, there are are probably a very good effects for the partner countries, uh, but we shouldn't make it a precondition uh, in every event. Um, to give you another example, the European Union has published the Delegated Act uh, with a definition of what is green hydrogen in the European sense. Uh, and that is a very, very complicated act. Um, and I talked to uh, people who have looked at the Inflation Reduction Act in the US and uh, they told me the US is making it easy, Europe is making it difficult. And that is a very problematic um, outcome uh, because obviously we try to make it right um, and we try to put as much sustainability into our acts as possible, but we need to make sure that in the end we also get some hydrogen and producers are not looking at other areas of the world where definitions might be much easier. Um, for example, we are talking to Australia and they are telling us, well, Japan um, has much easier uh, conditions, so we might sell it uh, there. So Australia is far away, so it might not be a very uh, good example, but we just, I mean, my point is, um, we should make sure that there is sustainability criteria, but we, um, should also make sure not to overdo it because then 
uh, nobody has helped. We don't get any hydrogen. It's uh, probably produced in an even less sustainable way uh, to feed into other markets. So we need to find that sweet spot um, to, uh, to, to do it right. But that's not so easy. Maybe I'll stop here, but uh, obviously open for further questions. Thanks so much, um, Dr. Bormaker. Um, let me pick one of the questions um, that were asked in the chat. Um, and this one is particularly close to my heart. Um, I'm in Vintook at the moment, and I'm hearing a lot about the plans of the Namibian government to build up the hydrogen project on the south of their coast. Um, building that will require quite a significant loan from international financial institutions. And as many other developing countries, um, the, they have quite a high uh, debt to GDP ratio. So their space for flexibility um, and fiscal space is quite limited. So the question that I'd like to tie to that condition or to that, yeah, to that condition that I'm sure is not unique is uh, Abdallah's question who, and Abdallah asks, while Germany is accelerating hydrogen adoption and production in other countries, does it commit to buy the hydrogen from all those countries it is helping when they start to produce it? There are a lot of uncertainties we know around uh, the hydrogen market um, and who, who will bear the greatest risk and the greatest cost. Uh, I'm not sure who of the panelists would like to come uh, in on that question. Well, Maybe. I, I, can, I can give two sentences of my thoughts. Um, we're trying to build up a global hydrogen market and we're trying to help uh, for the build up of that. That doesn't mean that we commit to, to buy all the hydrogen uh, ourselves. Uh, by the way, the German government is not buying any hydrogen at all. It's private actors. So in the end, the commitment uh, needs to come from the market, from the off takers. Uh, but it would also help these countries, even if they don't sell to Germany, if there are other markets. And then I think the whole world will profit from that. Uh, Ms. Ulrich, would you like to add to that? I strongly believe that since a lot of countries are on a zero carbon emissions pathway, that there will be a global market for hydrogen. So um, there might be the situation that too many people um, invest into hydrogen production, but it's doubtful at the moment. You have to obviously look at the global market and um, get a feeling for the demand, but in my opinion, it's a rising demand. And right now I talk to a lot of companies that are interested, like ThyssenKrupp, to trans for the, uh, to invest into production facilities that require hydrogen. So the demand is rising and will be rising as soon as the infrastructure is available to produce hydrogen, transport it, and get it to the companies um, that require it. So um, at this point in time, I'd say um, there is a demand, a rising demand. At a certain point, there might be a situation where we have too much hydrogen available, but uh, I don't see that in the near future. And um, I'm sure we can come up with ways to use it properly and um, in a way that um, benefits everybody. Um, at the same time, um, I want to point out because um, the I understand the as a parliamentarian, I understand um, the perspective from the Ministry of Economic Affairs at this, on this panel. At the same time, I wanted to add that our Ministry of International Cooperation and um, um, Development um, has actually put forward um, a press release that it will assist Namibia with um, certain on the ground works to include civil society, to uh, look at the consequences of building a huge hydrogen project in Namibia 
So um, different ministries in the German government look at different aspects of uh, international trade agreements or of, um, of understandings between countries um, to produce hydrogen and um, to import it. Um, from my perspective, it is our, um, our job to build infrastructure that allows the import of hydrogen. But as Dr. Bümmerke uh, said, it's not our role to buy it. That is the company's um, prerogative. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we can support countries in the global south to um, support their civil society, to look at the people um, that want to work in these facilities uh, with certain skill sets um, and to support education in the countries and also look at freshwater availability and environmental impact. It's, um, I think, learning from our history, that is an obligation that we have to keep in mind when looking at trade agreements or at corporations with the Global South. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Ulish. Um, I'm looking at the clock and as usual, it always moves faster than you want it to on these occasions. Um, so I wonder if I can perhaps bring in the two questions um, that are in the chat for Mr. Shorp um, and um, that we can, we can start wrapping up the panel. Um, so the two, actually there are a few questions um, to you, but the ones I find quite interesting, um, uh, are from uh, Luisa Kebler um, and Flavio Lira. Um, so Luisa is asking, given Tyson Krupp's gigantic need for green hydrogen in comparison to the scarcity of green hydrogen, are you also considering blue hydrogen or putting CCS on your DRI plants uh, or existing plants that are running on fossil fuels? That's the first question. And the second question that I think is really key and is something that Katrine or Ms. Ulish started speaking to is um, that um, the question of um, developing markets and capacities in um, global South countries where the hydrogen is produced. Um, is this something that you are seeing as happening? Um, what would it take for Tyson Krupp to uh, establish production facilities in the global south where green hydrogen is produced? Just try to switch my, my mic on, sorry. Um, yeah, on the first question um, regarding um, blue hydrogen, yeah, that's the point I, I, I wanted to make when I prepared this. Um, uh, this event um, a bit few hours ago because um, I read some recommendations on this in, in your report so uh, it was a point I was uh, a bit focusing in uh, on um, our goal is to go for as much green hydrogen as we can get on the market but as is mentioned in the questions the market is very scarce and they also already mentioned the dimensions of our needs yeah compared to what is on the market currently and there are only very few final investments decisions on green hydrogen production, especially in Europe. So um, there will be scarcity in the coming years. Um, and that's why we, when we talk with our suppliers, we won't produce our hydrogen ourselves uh, in North Rhine-Westphalia. It's not a good idea to produce it. So we are in talks with suppliers. Um, and um, in these talks, we are also considering other options. Yeah. Not because we think that it's long term the best way to go. If we really want to produce climate friendly steel, we will have to use as much green hydrogen as possible. But as long as we can't get it, it's better to use also other types of climate friendly hydrogen. And blue hydrogen, um, from our perspective, must be an option in a transitional period. Huh? Um, that's just the reality. Huh? Um, yeah. 
I think the second question was putting CCS on our DR plant. I, I don't know where Luisa comes from, but if she knows Germany well, I think she already knows the answer. It's a bad idea to do something like that in Germany, even though the positions are slightly changing. Also within the Green Party, I think CCS is a very difficult issue in Germany, so we're not focusing um, at all on that solution currently. Might change in the future, but no, uh, it's not an option for us um, for our concrete decarbonization project. And then the second question, um, basically, did I get it right? Was about producing steel elsewhere where the hydrogen is available? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, it was the question by Fabian Barrera. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, is the company considering developing DRI production in countries with steel production experience, iron ore yeah. and cheap renewable energy? Uh, what I can say, I think in the industry, it's clearly uh, uh, happening uh, that uh, steel companies are looking at different locations. As regards uh, ThyssenKrupp Steel, uh, we have a clear plan for the transformation of our current production facilities. We want to have a, a social uh, transition, a social transformation of our business. We want to keep jobs in Germany. So our key target is to transform our steel production in Germany. Yeah? So this is currently um, uh, not an option for us, but of course the market will evolve, um, regulation will evolve over the coming years and we always have to adjust. But our current project, which is really huge and it's not only let's say an idea or an interest, it's a concrete project, which is already running. We are already hiring people. Yeah? It's not, we have signed a contract for this first DR plan worth more than 1.8 billion euros. So it's it's not about strategy talking, it's about concrete implementation. This project is entirely focused on transforming our production in Germany. And if we get the hydrogen economy right, if we get the hydrogen, if we achieve a, an efficient hydrogen market ramp up, uh, we also have to accelerate renewable power deployment in Europe, especially also in Germany, then at the end, it will be possible to produce green steel um, competitively also in Germany. It's, that's, 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 not a, that's not a dream, it's, it's, it's achievable if we uh, decide uh, on the right, the right regulatory framework and the right market conditions. Thanks, uh, Mr. Schaub. Um, I think maybe a, a final question to Nidal, Rodrigo and Fabian, just because I would like to bring you in again before we close. Um, Dr. Burmaker earlier mentioned the need for speed. And, you know, that really emphasized for me uh, the difference in the needs between Global South and Global North countries. I think I can fully understand uh, the need for speed in Germany. But when I reflect on how things are working here in Namibia and South Africa, the need for speed is really undermining the ability of these projects to achieve their aims, I think, and to, and to be sustainable. Many of the communities um, who will in future may host green hydrogen projects, actually in our experience, never heard about it, even though EIAs have been approved, even though there are, you know, there, there are listed as strategic projects. And so, and, and also from the, you know, from the perspective of value adds and really ensuring a different kind of relationship of trade between Global South and Global North, the kinds of skills um, and capabilities that one would need for that simply don't exist uh, in many of the communities um, in the Global South. So I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Uh, perhaps Rodrigo, I can ask you to go first. All right. Uh, well, I think that's not the case of Chile. Like uh, we are discussing about green hydrogen since 2019, I think that's when it started. And uh, there are some dialogues, especially in the North, in uh, Antofagasta, and in the extreme south in Punta Arenas in Magallanes. Uh, people in the north are more related with uh, non-renewable natural resources, like mining, you know? So for them, uh, I think they, they, they feel something like a gold fever, not just about green hydrogen, but also about uh, minerals like lithium. To, uh, all right, so, um, that concern about the, the opportunity uh, and the jobs that, uh, that, that uh, we can create there or the capabilities or, yeah, but not so hard on the impact 
on a territory. There's also a lot of social need in the, in the North North. Um, on the other side in the South, people are more concerned about the impact on the territory. Uh, to put an example, uh, I, um, there is a discussion about a, a big French project uh, in the front of uh, Tierra del Fuego, uh, Lanfa, I, I think it's in, in English, I'm not sure. So, but uh, the, the, the size of the project, it's, it's 1.5, uh, uh, the, size, the size of Santiago. So it's a huge uh, wind project, just there. Uh, and uh, we want to make it, but we want to make it well. You know, uh, we want to make them fast. We are ready for that. Uh, we are we are already producing green hydrogen, uh, and in a pilot scale, a small scale, but still, like uh, uh, we 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 are uh, we are in the question on, on how and who and and. Uh, and more about the governance and the participation of the communities, and yeah, the concerns about the impact on the territory. So, but uh, I can I can talk about Chile like one big population thinking the same. We have big difference between north and south. Just to, just to put an example, right? Yeah. Thank Thanks. you so much, Mr. Astorga. Um, Mr. Atia, do you want to come in with some final thoughts about speed or anything else that has been raised uh, in the conversation? Yes, so uh, from our side, we are actually trying to uh, open uh, windows for discussion to also uh, bring the uh, uh, civil society perspective to the uh, uh, debate around green uh, hydrogen. It's clear that uh, uh, the question of uh, what the orientation uh, uh, to uh, invest massively into uh, green hydrogen in Tunisia has been raised by uh, important actors, especially by uh, Germany. It wasn't uh, it's a recent uh, uh, topic uh, here in, in in Tunisia, and uh, we uh, believe that it's important to uh, avoid uh, first of all the mistakes we made with the the energy uh, transition. Like I said before, we are still uh, struggling and too far from our objective. So uh, it's important to be realistic to avoid uh, having uh, uh, big ambitions without uh, a concrete uh, plan to reach uh, uh, a win-win relationship. This is very important because, uh, again, uh, we cannot accept another uh, failure in this uh, decarbonization. We have ambitious targets concerning, like I mentioned, 35% 35, 35 of renewables by uh, 2030 and even uh, um, uh, net uh, zero by 2050. But uh, we don't want uh, also to win uh, uh, time to continue in this uh, uh, with this uh, rhythm. Uh, this is also uh, a risk uh, because after all, green hydrogen won't be implemented uh, in the very short term. So we have also to look at uh, the very urgent uh, measures we need to take. Uh, I situate actually green hydrogen within this uh, energy transition or ecological transition uh, uh, in Tunisia. And uh, we believe that uh, uh, once this strategy will be implemented, more actors will be involved in the debates. It's, uh, we need to have uh, a dialogue with actors from the South in order to uh, reach a uh, win-win relationship again. Yeah and set the terms um, that uh, work for both sides, I guess. Sabian, if I can ask you to come in with literally a few words, because we're really running out of time here, I would really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I just want to say, in order to, to take some of the different questions posed in the, in the panel, that, uh, that there are an intrinsic link between binding criteria and the needs of the communities. And this link is related to the need of the undermine the presumption of the common good of the way which the transition is made. This one based on the unavoidable of need for it. This is very important point because there is still talk a single transition, but in reality, we have two transitions, one for the first world and one for the third world. In the, in the first world, you have circular economy for Euro, the European countries. You have hydrogen production and recycling for local consumption. You have transformation of productive apparatus for the transition, focused on technology development for the European countries. And in the third world, you have 
enclave economy, extraction of raw materials, hydrogen production for exportation, uh, there is no technology transfer, uh, mm. and even Europe in continuity extractivism contrary to the transition. This mm. is the case of coal in Colombia. Actually, uh, German governments say that they need the coal for Colombia, and German government know that the coal in Colombia produce a cataclysm in the environmental uh, ecosystems, in the urban conflict, in the community. So this is like to to see to the other side, no? And actually, in a in a cross-cutting way, there is a double. Uh, there are a double environmental standard with European companies. Uh, take right. advantage of the weak uh, regulation of the countries, countries such as, as Colombia, and European countries do not consider the promotion of the more robust standard as a common rule for the trade and for the promotion of the transition. Okay, Th thank you so much, um, Fabian. Um, I I had a follow up questions to a follow up question to you, Dr. Burmaker, um, around whether there is a more precise timing. Uh, for the hydrogen strategy. Um, however, <laughs> I guess this is what's called saved by the bell. We're really out of time and I haven't given uh, Mr. Funchelt uh, an opportunity to say a few closing words. So let me hand over to him, but please feel free to type the answer in the chat, Mr. Bormaker. Thank you um, very much, Karen, and thanks um, to all the panelists um, who spoke today, also in the name of Wood um, and Heinrich Böll Foundation, and thanks to all the participants um, online. Um, we had a we had a rich discussion with a lot of issues, and I see in the chat still a lot of unanswered questions. Um, so I think. There is a lot to talk about, and my first thought is we should do this more often and engage more often in such a south-north exchange on this issue of hydrogen. Also, um, in the way as Nidal has put it, um, that we need this dialogue to ensure really that this new hydrogen economy becomes a win-win. I think um, some of the points we made in the beginning held quite strongly in the discussion, especially the point on um, prioritization um, of hydrogen um, in the in the hydrogen strategy so we really hope that this um, will be ensured in the final document um, as far as I heard it we only discussed green hydrogen so I think this prioritization or hope this prioritization will will hold as well and on the issue of sustainability criteria um, from what I heard um, I mean, we heard colleagues from, from the Global South and many questions that criteria are important to really ensure that mistakes from the past are not repeated and that really people in the Global South in producing countries really benefit from this new hydrogen economy. So we need those criteria and I hope we find ways to work together on them, on that, discuss them and really make them mandatory in a way that yes we get the speed to ramp up hydrogen production but really in a way that is um, sustainable and um, really um, helping the people at place so having said all that i hope we can engage in further discussions and thank you very much for joining <laughs>